Welcome in Anum, and in an Alfred in this video, I welcome to you another exciting video, in this case part 20 of my organisational series. In this case, I'll be attempting to provide an overview of the structure and development of the British Armour Division during World War II. I had no intention of creating more than a few of these videos, as I expected that they were so esoteric only the highest order nerd would be interested in such material, but it appears I am wrong. I now suspect that uh, my standard videos are actually more esoteric than this, which um, is a complex video and probably only of interest to people of the highest order intelligence and passion, but nonetheless um, there are more people that would be interested in this than uh, what I normally pump out, which is an interesting observation. I must point out that um, this ability or interest may not be able to assist you in finding a life partner, but it can certainly help kill time as you sit in your room alone. The ability to kill time by yourself is a skill which will become increasingly critical as you grow older and less ambulatory, and trust me on this point. The background to why I've created this video can be found in my previous video, part 18, which covers the German Panzer Division. There's no need to process this information to view the rest of this video, but if you're interested, go and look at part 18 as well as this one. The main focus of these videos is the battalion, um, as once I go down to a company level, the to &E would be significantly longer and more complex, and the video would be probably four hours long instead of 30 minutes long. I may come back and break down battalions to company level, but certainly not in this video. First is the typical division in a specific period, in this case the 1st Armoured Division, dated 3rd September 1939 which was slated to go to France if the complex escal conflict escalated in 1939, but um, it didn't escalate and it did not go to France until the following year. Next level of command is the brigade or equivalent. Uh, this is indicated with the red lines. The number of brigades in this formation is indicated as is its combat strength. The final formation level is the battalion or equivalent. The number of each battalion is indicated, in this case, three tank battalions. Moving to the right, we come to the battalion's combat strength, in this case, 569, followed by battalion code and finally combat values, using a set of rules based on the SPI Modern Battles, uh, Modern Battles board game. This value will generally be ignored that is the board game value in this video, as it's used for a set of figure gaming rules. But the other values will be used as they provide an idea of the battalion type and strength. In front of the battalion name is a mobility symbol, which could be motorised, mot, as you can see here, horse, cycle, armoured, and so on. If there's no symbol, it means it's on foot. For some battalions, an idea of the weapon within it is provided. In this case, this is a regiment uh, which consists of uh, 25 pounder guns. Uh, quick note, the British are called regiments, um, what other people would normally call battalions. So while it's a regiment, it's a, a battalion size. Below this entry, you'll see a two pounder anti-tank battalion and below this, a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun battalion. Now we come to the combat strengths or values. This is a points value of that formation using a rather old set of figure gaming rules. In this case, Corps Commander. I could have used any set of rules and while the results would vary a bit, I found they are all generally similar. Of course, how close do these points value reflect reality is another issue, which in this video I will not be covering. I must point out that in this point system, no provision for a formation's morale or quality is taken into account. Thus, a German 1941 Panzer battalion would have a significant advantage over a Soviet tank battalion in 1941 due to quality and morale. But trying to factor these subjective things in is so subjective it would make my analysis useless. Viewers will need to take quality and morale factors into mind if they wish to compare the strengths of one nationality against another. Even within the same nationality, the troop quality of a 1941 Panzer Battalion, German, would be higher than a 1939 or 1945 Panzer Battalion. Viewers will need to make their own subjective call if they wish to perform such a chronolog chronologically based comparison. But I feel that quality-wise, the British always remained generally at a reasonably high quality level for the entire war. So I suspect quality-wise, there may be a little difference between a British 1939 tank battalion and one in 1945. Although granted, experience was higher in 1945, so there was some slight improvement. 
Let's now drill down into the analysis portion, starting with 1939 and specifically the German invasion of Poland and the French attack in 1939. The British, British quickly assembled two armoured divisions, one in Egypt and one in England, which was slated to be shipped over to France if required. This table shows the first armoured division in September 1939. In reality, this was the intended structure of the division, which would have been sent over if required in 1939. As it turned out, the first armoured was sent over in May 1940, after many of its formations were sent elsewhere. So this formation never fought, but represents my starting point. This division consisted of a support group, light armoured and heavy armoured brigade. At a divisional level, there was an engineer battalion. This was a reasonably bare-bones structure. The support group was a mixed formation which consisted of all the support formations of the division. As you can see, it contained an artillery regiment, which was a large battalion-sized formation, an anti-tank regiment, anti-tank an anti-aircraft regiment, and two motorised infantry battalions. The British regiment was normally the equivalent of, let's say, a German or US battalion. The Light Armoured Brigade consisted of three light tank regiments, which were a battalion sized. The Heavy Armoured Brigade consisted of three medium tank regiments, which were also of battalion sized, even though they were called regiments. In the desert, a similarly structured armoured division was also formed, although it dif differed in strength based on what formations were available in the desert. The Rifle Motor Battalion was rather interesting as the troops were mounted in fully tracked carriers. The carriers were not what I would call fully armoured personnel carriers, but gave the troops excellent cross-country mobility and contained some organic firepower. I suppose you could compare them to the German half-track mounted infantry battalions. The war did finally hot up big time for the British in 1940, and while the 1st Armoured Division did not arrive in France until Later in May 1940, after the German begin, or after the Germans had actually advanced quite a bit, it did see some actions before being withdrawn. The First Armoured Division, which was sent to France in May 1940, differed in a host away from the September 1939 or even its original 1937 structure. The Armoured Engineer Battalion was beefed up significantly in this division. On the other hand, the number of motor battalions were reduced from two to one, reducing the amount of infantry which was already in rather short supply. The two light armoured brigades were removed, and the number of armoured brigades, all being medium, were increased from one to two. Within the medium tank regiment, which was battalion size, the combat strength went up due to improved equipment and increased numbers of medium tanks. This was a very different division from the one that was formed or was going to be formed in September 1939. The British had an additional armoured division in the Middle East called the 7th Armoured Division. The structure of many formations in the Middle East was often dictated by what was available rather than any official structure. But these div divisions did match the official structure much closer than the German Panzer divisions in Africa as a comparison. If you download the TONEs from Nihorsta, you will notice the British gave each official structure a Roman numeric. In this case, this was the third official structure of the armoured division. In this structure, an armoured car regiment was added under divisional control. Almost all the battalion-sized regiments were beefed up in terms of combat strength. This was both a combination of better equipment, as well as increased number of weapons and support formations. The motor battalion in particular was very strong according to the point system I'm using and it was the most powerful battalion sized formation in the division although this probably would have been mainly in you know in terms of defense rather than being able to attack the most powerful attack formations certainly were the armored regiments the two armored brigades also grew in combat strength in this case mainly due to superior equipment however the biggest change was the addition of a motor battalion in each brigade this went some way to resolve the lack of cross-brigade exchange formation capability and gave the tanks some infantry support, uh, something that was a major issue that was uncovered in France in May 1940. The British had learned a number of lessons in France in 1940 and had made some changes to resolve them, such as adding the motor infantry to the tank brigades. 
But the biggest issue was the tank-heavy nature of the division and the lack of an ability to create a task force from any asset within the division from any brigade. The 7th Armoured Division, dated in February 1941, differed little from the previous table and represented adjustments made to the division based on what equipment was being shipped to it. The biggest change was in the Armoured Brigade, where most of the battalion-sized regiments increased their combat strength. Once again, new equipment and some additional support assets was what caused this increase in combat strength. We will now move to 1942, during which the armoured divisions, the British armoured divisions, experienced their greatest challenges and their greatest victories. This chart shows the 7th Armoured Division in January 1942, and you can see it was the fourth organisational structure, at least official organisational structure. The divisional formations experienced uh, only minimal changes in this new structure. In the 4th Org structure, the support group was removed and replaced with a Divisional Artillery Regiment, although it was never called Regiment, a Divisional Artillery Formation, let's say, and a Motor Brigade. Initially, the Divisional Artillery only consisted of the 25-pounder formations, or regiments. The Motor Brigade consisted of more 25-pounders and 2-pounder regiments. I'm uncertain where the anti-aircraft went in this organisation. The formation of the motor brigade dramatically increased the amount of infantry in the division, even though um, the one carrier mounted formation was now replaced with three, three truck mounted formations. This nonetheless had a positive impact on addressing the tank heavy nature of this division. The structure of the armoured brigades did not change, but now contained the only tracked carrier mounted infantry within the division which was also beginning to use US-supplied half-tracks. This shows the 7th Armoured Division in May 1942 and was the 5th organisational structure. The divisional formation or divisional formations experienced only minimal changes. All artillery and anti-tank and anti-aircraft battalion size formations were moved to the Armoured Divisional Formation. The biggest change in the divisional, uh, divisional artillery formation was the introduction of the 6-pounder anti-tank gun, which dramatically increased the combat strength of the anti-tank regiment. On the other hand, the infantry brigade lost its artillery and anti-tank battalions, or regiments, although it did retain some anti-tank formations under direct regimental control. It was otherwise unchanged, apart from some minor changes in the support formations of the regiment. The structure of the armoured brigades did not change, but the quality of tanks had continued to increase dramatically, resulting in a major increase in combat strengths. These tank battal battalions packed a significant punch. The 10th Armoured Division in the desert and in October still used the 5th Org structure, but the introduction of new armoured ca uh, cars did have a significant impact on the armoured car regiment, increasing its strength. The other major changes to this division was the addition of self-propelled howitzers, in this case rep replacing the towed 25-pounders. Initially, the British had to use the US 105mm howitzers in their self-propelled howitzers. In 1943, or by 1943, the British Army was receiving significant amounts of US equipment and the, in the final Tunisian campaign, it was probably the last where we see many different British tank types or where the bulk of the equipment was of British manufacturer. This chart shows the 6th Armoured Division in Italy, dated April 1943. This was the 6th official org structure of the British Army. Most of the formations under the divisional control had grown, but the reconnaissance regiment had dramatically risen in combat power it was beginning to get better armoured cars and even tanks in, in its structure. This tended to be common or a common theme among many nationalities. The reconnaissance formations grew in most of the armies during the war, indicating its importance, especially for armoured divisions. In Italy, the towed 25-pounders had returned, but the self-propelled howitzers remained as well. The British did replace the US 105 howitzers for 25-pounders in their self-propelled um, in their self-propelled howitzers in order to simplify logistics, but uh, I am uncertain if this had occurred or was occurring in Italy. 
The other four nations continue to grow in combat strength, in some cases due to new ammunition for the six-pounders, such as the APDS rounds, which dramatically improved the anti-tank capability of these anti-tank guns. The infantry and armoured brigades remain much the same. In most cases, the divisions were equipped with Sherman tanks in Italy, with the British leaving their older British manufactured tanks behind in Tunisia. I, ex I expect this level of standardisation had logistics benefits in terms of repair and maintenance. We now move to 1944, which began with the British main theatre of operation in Italy, but um, by mid-1944, the main theatre of operation had moved or expanded to France. This shows the 6th Armoured Division in Italy dated January 1944. The divisional support formations remained generally the same. However, lots of fine tuning was occurring concerning new equipment. There was no changes to the Armoured Divisional Artillery Formation or to the Guards Infantry Brigade. There was no real changes to the armoured brigades um, and, as indicated earlier, they all used Sherman tanks. The big advantage of the Sherman was the 75mm gun had an excellent HE round, which proved to be highly useful in the rough terrain of Italy. We now move to the French campaign. This shows the Guards Armoured Division in June 1944. This was using the 7th Org structure. This was one of the divisions which were equipped with only British tanks with most of the other armoured divisions, British armoured divisions, possessing Sherman tanks. The structure of the division support formation remained much the same as previous divisions. Guards armoured divisional artillery formation had a host of additional formations added to it for the invasion of France. It possessed a towed 25-pounder regiment, a self-propelled 25-pounder regiment, and a 6-pounder anti-tank regiment, which was similar to the previous structures that we've, sh we've seen. However, tank destroyer batteries have now been added. In this case, there were two batteries. This also contained the standard towed anti-aircraft regiment, but also contained a self-propelled anti-aircraft regiment. By June 1944, for the French campaign, the British self-propelled howitzers were now equipped with 25-pounders rather than the 105mm howitzers, and this almost certainly was due to logistics issues, possibly also a bit of national pride. We'll now move to the Guards Infantry Brigades. The infantry battalions gained additional support formations as well as better anti-tank guns under battalion command control. Finally, we move to the Armoured Brigade, which fielded the rather good and powerful Cromwell tank, and as a result was a fairly powerful Armoured Battalion. The Armoured Battalions in this division was probably the most powerful in the British Army, a combination of a lot of tanks, and these were actually reasonably good tanks. We'll now move to 1945. I must point out I'm using my TO&E armoured divisions equipped with British equipment as much as possible. Historically, this may be misleading as most armoured divisions, that is the British armoured divisions, were equipped with US Sherman tanks, which in this, you know, which I must admit in the case of the Firefly were often modified by the British, but were nonetheless US tanks. We'll continue with the British Guards Armoured Division simply because it was equipped with British tanks and that's what I wanted to focus on. While some minor changes were still occurring in the divisional support troops, it was more related to new equipment than any serious attempt to change the structure. The British, as far as the British were concerned, they had the correct structure and they weren't going to really change it. The same applied to the formations in the divisional artillery formation. One point was the self-propelled anti-aircraft guns were often missing in most British divisions. It was found the anti-aircraft was not that critical and the British were experiencing manpower shortages. So removing unneeded formations and sending the freed up manpower into the front line was common. There were no changes to the Motor Infantry Brigade, although as mentioned, manpower was becoming an issue. So I'd expect in the field, these formations were probably under strength. By the end of the war, the British were, had received the excellent A-34, or Comet medium tank. While this vehicle did not see that much action, the combat strength impact was significant. This was certainly the most powerful tank battalion the British had ever fielded in the war. Like many other nationalities, the British Armoured Division development went through a number of different paths. The first path was basic organisation. 
The initial divisions were tank heavy and lacked adequate support formations and infantry in their official structure. The British had solved this basic organisational issue by 1942 after experiencing some bitter lessons in both France and the desert. The next development path was the equipment. The early tanks, while good in some areas, all had significant shortcomings. I must point out the British tanks were not specifically inferior to many German tanks in 1940, but the Germans had issues as well, and when the Germans started primarily fielding only Panzer threes and Panzer fours, the British issue was too significant to ignore. The story of British tank development in many ways was a rather sad one. I'll not go into the details, but the British developed an, an astoundingly large number of different tanks during the war, which often had major issues. When the British introduced the Cromwell, they finally had a good tank which could take on the German Panzer IVs, but it was not until the Comet that they could really take on the Panthers. Other weapons were also developed in the war which had a significant impact on combat capabilities, specifically the armoured cars and anti-tank guns. This story is not unusual and many other combatants went through a similar general path, even if the details differed. However, the most important development path was the area of doctrine. The Germans proved that unbalanced divisions and inferior tanks could be overcome if your doctrine was superior to your opponents. While the British generally improved during the entire war, it was not until the 1944 invasion of France that the armoured divisions started operating in a German style of combined arms operation, with formations between brigades being swapped around in order to create an optimal force mix to take on a mission. While they never got to the same level of proficiency as the Germans, they certainly matched the US, and I suspect their, their changes to doctrine occurred because of the US rather than lessons learnt from the Germans. I must point out that theoretically the boffins back in England understood this, it's just that they couldn't get the actual brigades to understand it and implement a combined arms operation. The development of this doctrine is fascinating and it started on an ad hoc basis in the 7th Armoured Division in 1944 and when it proved very successful it spread to all the other armoured divisions. In some ways, the British surpassed the Germans with the introduction of the first infantry fighting vehicle in late 1944. Because doctrine tends to be boring, I have noticed this tends to get overlooked by many historians, even if they give lip service to the German Blitzkrieg. Robert M. Citino being the exception, although I don't agree with everything he writes about, his focus on the German doctrine, or any doctrine, is very correct. There are a few unique British aspects to consider. The first is their love of armoured cars. While the Italian, Italians certainly liked their armoured cars, the British took this to a unique extreme. I'm uncertain why this was the case, but the British had a very wide range of rather good armoured cars in their reconnaissance forces. Starting in late 1942, the reconnaissance battalions or regiments began their steady and constant growth in combat strength. Prior to this, they were often misused, but by late 1942, this was no longer the case. When the British were fighting in Europe, they began to insert fully tracked tanks into these formations. As they discovered, like the Germans in Russia, wheeled vehicles could not keep up with tanks in poor terrain. But even up to 1945, the armoured car was plentiful in British service. The other interesting aspect of the British division was their early use of infantry carried in tracked vehicles. The motor battalion in 1937 was fully tracked and the British always ensured the tanks were supported by fully tracked mounted infantry uh, when they were supported by infantry. In most cases they weren't, but that was not the you know, fault of the people putting the divisions together. The carrier was certainly effective in moving infantry, but it may have lacked the protection of a fully armoured half-track. The British began to use US-supplied half-tracks late, later in the war in order to resolve this issue. The end point was the use of the infantry fighting vehicle in late 1944, which was the earliest use of an actual infantry fighting vehicle which was armoured. These tracked infantry battalions packed significant punch, both due to the vehicle carrying the infantry and supporting formations. This occurred with the German half-track mounted infantry battalions as well, and gave these formations, at least in theory, significantly a greater attack strength than a typical soft-skin mounted infantry battalion. 
Well, you're not unique compared with the Germans. The British tank battalions grew in strength during the war. The British use of the light tank battalion was quickly discontinued, with light tanks being forced focused in reconnaissance formations as much as possible. The medium tank battalions grew from 569 points using my point system in September 1939 to 2,077 points in May 1945, which was a significant growth in combat power. The Comet in particular being a very good tank and was possibly the best Western Allied medium tank and probably even better than the Soviet T-44, making it the best in class among the Allies. In this case, I'm assuming the Pershing and Centurion are heavy tanks and not included in my comparison. This impressive development may have been a result of the abysmal tank development record of the British earlier in the war, which I have to admit was more as a result of political inference than a lack of any inherent skill in the British tank design world. There are many aspects of British Army I've not covered, such as heavy tanks and their highs and lows. However, these are not part of the armoured divisions and I'll not cover them in this video. But to get a full picture of the British armoured history, you need to look at the British heavy tank brigades as well. And this concludes part 20 of my video series on the British Armoured Division, with a focus on the structure down to a battalion level. Alle guten Dingen, kommen zu einem Ende.